this story I'm about to tell you is 100% true. This happened sometime in November of 2010. I was fishing with my friend Rico in a lake near the country club of Miami. To no surprise, we never caught anything. We were ready to give up until Rico noticed a blue case by the shore that was covered up poorly by some leaves. As we got closer, the smell was horrible. Rico was actually about to throw up. I had a high tolerance for foul odors, so I went up to the case and opened it. I never thought I would ever see this in my life. In the case was a human body part. Not only was there blood, but the plastic was poorly wrapped. We called the police, to which surprisingly they arrived very quickly, and the area was soon a crime scene investigation. A couple of days passed by, and of course, since I'm curious about the situation, I look for news articles online. And it turns out, the body part we found was a male torso, and it was one of the two other body parts we had found. The other two were hidden in different parts of Broward County. To make matters worse, the body parts were from the same person. And the guy who killed him didn't have a motive. He just killed him. Turns out, the police were struggling to find clues to catching the murderer, because at the time, there were other separate incidents similar to this one, and after we called about the torso, they had more information and were able to locate and arrest the murderer. To this day, that man remains in jail, but it's still a pretty scarring situation, considering I've never seen a dead person, let alone a body part. And to make matters even more worse, we found this behind a middle school. If anyone's interested in actually researching about it, just look up Dead Body Behind Country Club Middle School. Three days ago, my old man went out of town. The first night, I heard what I assumed was a large critter. As of 4.13 a.m. when I posted this, I think they're gone for good. This is a long but recent and true story. I want to say I'm glad they left or knew I was armed and it wasn't worth dying or killing me over. Whatever the reason, two nights ago, I was awoken by my dog between 11 a.m. and 3 a.m. at the most. He kept near me when I got up and made a low, aggressive growl, facing out of my room, but kept close to me. He has never done this before. I've worked with canines for years. This gave me a gut feeling, and then I heard it. Someone was talking. They were in my yard, no more than 20 feet by the sound of it. It was low mumbling or bad whispering. I was blaring Return of the King, Yes, extended. I need to add that I have childlike hearing at my age for context. If you speak in a one-floor home with two doors closed at a whisper, I can make words out. He went quiet when I opened the drawer too loud to grab my hidden 380, chambered around, and noticed a shadow passing by light outside the blurred window. My home was clear. All the doors were locked. There was nothing odd but my dog peeled out. I held my flashlight in one hand, went his way, and called him to the other side. He was gone. I guess they knew I was home and ran on foot. I went around for a thought. Okay, I'm good. Well, Florida continues to be Florida. Night three. My dog does this again in the same frame, waking me up. At this rate, I just got the 12 gauge. My dog was acting far more protective and gave me the dog body language for major threat, need the pack, can't handle alone. I froze for a moment. Two people now. Fuck. This is not good. They must intend to violently take whatever they could be after. It was the guy from before and a new one. I can't risk getting a look. At this rate, they mean business and they had to be armed to scope out a place with a ring camera 
60 pounds plus of muscle of a dog, and my grown ass with a lifetime of handling guns, in the yard at around 2.30 a.m. for a second night. They knew my dog and I were home, but clearly had a goal. This time, voices were behind the home. My dog then pulled a Leroy Jenkins. He gave one of the most aggressive, loud barks I've ever seen any dog do and ran to the wall. I ran to his side and yelled, Fuck em up, they're dead men. Now shit's clicking for me. This was planned and professional. I checked every inch of the property with a shotgun. My dog was worked up and spooked, but calming. I'm buying him a steak for this one, and a good one. I went inside. I kept my firearm with me and chambered it, and I kept it in reach of my bed. I barely slept that night. Day 4. I did a bit of looking around for misplaced or slightly moved objects or scratched locks. Yeah, one trash can by the gate was rotated 180 degrees with the handle facing me, not the wall as it's always been placed. There were a few crushed dead twigs as I went back. The head chair was turned and moved to the right, a clearly odd thing as that table is symmetrical so it's glaringly obvious it's out of place if you live there. The ring camera and my neighbors so far show nothing, but I knew these guys had to have known my dad left. They knew his sons lived there, that the dog is huge and would eat them, that I had a gun and I even announced that I was armed. Yet this person came back with backup, and the guy came back, moved shit I didn't know until my marine buddy told me to check if so much as a rock was out of place. It's a way to gauge the person's awareness and presence, I guess. So to my late night visitors, whatever your goal was, let's not meet. Now, I think I should check if someone died in my mom's house. I live in the apartment at my mom's house, and lately I've been seeing the same person with white pajama-like clothes on. I've never seen their face, and I'm not sure about their gender. The first time was when I walked past the hallway, and I saw them standing in the master bedroom doorway out of the corner of my eye. When I looked, there was nothing but there was a white jacket hanging on a closet door, so I just assumed my mind was playing tricks on me. The second time was when I was outside by the pool, and I saw them standing in the master bedroom through the sliding glass door. They then walked towards the bed where my two-year-old sister was sleeping, and when I went to check, there was nothing. The third time was when we had a power outage and I was home alone. I decided to take a nap in some shade outside by the pool. I got this eerie feeling someone was looking at me in my dream, and I woke up. When I opened my eyes, they were standing right next to me, and shortly after, they vanished again. The last time was yesterday. I was putting up fencing on our gates so my puppy can walk and play freely outside in the backyard. One of the gates is in this long, narrow passage that goes from the backyard to the front yard next to the master bedroom. As I was working, I again got this eerie feeling someone was looking at me. I turned around, and there they stood at the end of the passage, and shortly after, they vanished again. Almost every time, I took it as my mind playing tricks on me. The first time... I thought I mistook the jacket for a person. The second, I thought it might have been a reflection on the glass. The third, I thought my mind was playing tricks on me because of the dream. But the fourth, I don't know why, but that one really freaked me out. So I told my mom about what I saw. She then told me that she saw a person in white clothing several mornings in the driveway when she drove to work but she said she stopped seeing them around the time I saw them the first time. Usually, I don't believe in this kind of thing, but I can't explain 
how my mom stopped seeing them in the driveway, and then I started seeing them near the master bedroom. This happened a few years ago, but it has impacted me greatly since then. I was in college, living in an on-campus dorm house. My college was small, and the dorm house was an actual house that had been converted from dorm rooms. My vehicle broke down and had to be towed from my dorm's parking lot to a dealership 20 miles away. I call a local tow truck company who sends a truck out and I decide to ride with the driver so that I can talk to the dealership service team about getting a rental. The whole drive down, this guy is talking about whatever hits his mind. I'm trying to be nice because it's a good 20 to 30 minute drive down and I might as well have a conversation. Along the drive down and the drive back, no luck with the rental, he turns from random conversation to specifically talking about his ex and how she did him wrong. I'm stuck in this truck with him, so I minimally respond and deflect when I can. He's got the upper hand because I've stupidly decided that riding with him was a good idea. We finally get back to my dorm and I make it inside safely. I figure that's the end of it because I'm not planning on needing a new tow anytime soon. But then I start getting texts and calls from an unknown number. Turns out, he copied my information off of the tow truck request form the company fills out when I called for a truck. I get majorly freaked out because I didn't give my information to the company so their driver could harass me. I also have to deal with random drive-bys by the driver, and he stopped by once to see if I was home. After weeks of texts and calls, I call the owner to talk about his driver, and he does the old, well maybe he just thought you were nice and you shouldn't be so stingy with him. I basically had to tell him I would be filing a restraining order or some equivalent for him to take it seriously. I still think about this every time I'm asked to give contact information for a home service job or see an unknown caller on my phone. And I've never ridden in another tow truck since... About 20 years ago, I'd just gotten off the train with my friend and we were exiting the station up the stairs and walking home. I glanced across the road and there was this guy standing rigid, just glaring at us. Neither of us knew him, we had no idea who he was. He was in a long coat and had dark, scruffy hair. His head swiveled to watch us walk past, still staring. I kind of mentally said, what the fuck? and then kept chatting to my friend. We went on a few more steps and glanced backwards. The man was crossing the road at a diagonal, heading our way. He was about 150 meters away. I picked up the pace a bit, but I didn't say anything to my friend because it just felt a bit stupid to be creeped out by. A couple more steps and I looked back again, and this guy is running at us. He was sort of crouched down, and his arms extended in front of him with his hands clawed. My friend has noticed too by this point, and we start running. As we get another 50 meters or so, a passenger walks up the same stairway from the station, crosses the footpath in between us and the man, and heads across the road to a laneway on the other side. The crazy man veers after him at the last second. We don't look back anymore. Our house is only a block away and we pelt home. As we're almost to our front gate, we heard a scream. We tore up the front steps, fell through the front door, and locked it behind us. I checked the news for a week afterwards, but there was nothing. I never saw that guy again. That was the most absolute animal panic I've ever felt in my life. My best friend of my whole life, and my only friend for a good chunk of my life, 
died about a week before we found out my then girlfriend was pregnant. I still hadn't graduated college due to a requirement that was overlooked by myself and my counselor. I'd started working full time to help take care of my son before he was born, so my days were non-stop. I wake up at 4.30 a.m., get to work by 5.30, work until noon or so, drive back home to shower real quick, leave for school and get to school, which could range from 40 minutes to one hour later. I'd go to class and then I'd leave school around 9 p.m. I go home, do whatever homework, and then sleep. I did this for months and one day I was hitting my limit. I was so tired. If I could only do one of these things, then I would have so much more energy to hang out with my son, be a good boyfriend to my girlfriend, and help out more around where we stayed. I worked Sunday through Thursday, and one Thursday after I'd come home and didn't have a class afterwards, I was laying down with my son. I had homework due the next day, and I was about half done with it. I was laying there, eyes closed, no one in the room but my son and I. Then a steady series of very hard and loud taps on my window woke me from my quasi-sleep. Sometimes when the neighbors were watering some plants, they would hit my window with it, and it sounded almost like that, but the window was dry. I thought maybe it was my father-in-law knocking on my window to say hi to the baby. I opened the door from my room to see everyone else who lives in the house in the living slash dining room. I closed the door again. Right before the knocking, I said, in my own head, Hey V, I think I'm just gonna drop out. Once I realized there was no other cause I could figure out, I sighed and said, Message received, bro. And I got out my homework. Another story takes place about a month or so after my son was born, roughly ten months after my brother's death. I'm still reeling from it, and I'm reeling from being a father. I was randomly parked out at a park near my house. It was obviously my son's first birthday. He was stumbling around, being one, whatever. To my right, I hear my brother's voice. Hey guys, sorry I'm late. Nipote. My head shot over to the sound, and there he was. I was so excited and shocked, I just went and tackled him straight to the ground, hugging him and crying. My mom, sister, and everyone else also came over to him. I was so happy he wasn't dead. He wasn't dead. Then it hit me. The sky had no color. Everything felt washed in the brush of a dream. I stopped looked at him and said, you died. Previously, he was laughing with everyone else. He tried ignoring me, like a dog that knows it's done something it shouldn't have. You died, I said again. The rest of the party stopped. You died, didn't you? He looked away from me. Defeated, he said. Yeah, and it hung in the air. My dream paused almost as if you could hit a stopwatch to reality. With everyone else frozen, he hugged me and said, I love you, man. Tell everyone else I love them too. He vanished, and I woke up crying. We have a camp that we visit during the hunting months and about every other weekend in between that. To get to our camp, you have to turn off of a major road onto a gravel road, drive about a mile, then turn onto another gravel road for about a half mile. It's set between a few other camps, plus some residents that live out there. It's quiet for the most part. There are some coyotes and bobcats. Bobcats are the worst due to their terrible scream. It sounds like a woman crying for help. There has also been a black panther and wild dogs. 2013, we were at the camp for Thanksgiving. We hunted, fished, cooked, drank, all that good camp stuff. On a night, we're sitting around a fire, swapping funny stories, 
and just listening to the silence of the woods. As we're talking, we all hear, help me. At first, we thought it was a bobcat. We listened some more and heard it again. It was a man's voice yelling, help me, repeatedly. Now, our first instinct was to grab our guns. Our second instinct was to go towards the voice. But you never know what you will encounter in the woods. It was dark and cold. The hunters knew the area very well. We called the police and explained everything to the responding officers. The weird part was that we never once heard it while the officers were with us. Not once. The officers left and we heard the man again, repeating, help me. About half an hour later, the officers came back and we didn't hear any call for help. Again, silence. We all decided it was best to go inside our camp for the night. We never did find out anything. I've only been back to the camp once since then. It really freaked me out. I was homeless. I had warning, had jobs, and I knew it was coming and I was prepared. I was with my husband. We had a minivan we modded for survival. We put our stuff in storage and drove to his new job. We then lived rough in the van while I ran my little telecommute business. Not an MLN, don't worry. I was homeless, not stupid. I picked up a part-time night shift gig in retail to help guarantee a safe parking spot. Six months of no rent, no utilities, and we had enough for a decent down payment on a house. So, most millennial thing ever, basically. Being secretly homeless, kind of on purpose, we still saw some shit. See, we were what I would call bougie homeless. My husband and I had white collar jobs, then I had a blue collar retail one as well. Eventually he got a retail one also, and just didn't mention his other qualifications. He took the same weekend graveyard shifts I was, and we'd stock shelves together purely to be indoors someplace with lighting and able to talk together. Not changing our last names to match was a good move. Our manager suspected we might have a thing for one another and was very, very startled when we later purchased a house together and turned out to have been married for five years. We had gym memberships for showering and exercise. The study rooms at libraries can be a great, quiet place to sleep if you know how. State parks are very good for good, restful sleep on nights when the store parking lot won't cut it. The food options were pretty awful, but we eventually learned to eat mainly from the produce section or to spring for stuff like trail mixes that didn't need refrigeration, yet they had a lot of protein and stuck with you pretty well. Excessive sodium is your enemy. It makes you thirsty as hell, which leads to restroom complications. I quickly learned that I was by no means the only employee of this retail store who technically lived in the parking lot on at least an intermittent basis, nor was I the only regular customer. The homeless population wasn't the problem at all. The general purpose poverty, lack of help from those who were trying, and lack of comfort for those who were suffering, other than the most toxic kind, that was the problem. I called an ambulance for a little kid whose mom wasn't moving in the bathroom. The kid was very calm about this. She probably just needs Narcan again. It's like how you have to plug in a phone sometimes, the kid said. The mom's purse, and it was a real one, cost more than a month in the house I'd left behind for this little bougie homeless adventure. Yet her shoes were some of the cheapest our store did. I wondered from that what her story was. I witnessed a drug dealer catching a kid shoplifting and marched them right back inside to return the stolen merchandise to me. He dope slapped them upside the head and offered me some marijuana on the house for being decent about the whole thing. I declined, thumping my chest and going, asthma. But I thanked him kindly for the offer and said dealer was polite as any neighbor to me after. 
I noticed there was often a car with very gaudy wheels parked not too far from the van, and once when I was walking back to the van at night and some footsteps began to follow me, matching pace, I glanced behind, and to my surprise, the middle-aged white guy suddenly found himself distracted by the occupants of the car with the gaudy wheels, one of whom was the pot dealer. I got into the van, told my husband to jump to the front and buckle up, and we drove to a different overnight spot. Pot dealers don't seem like bad sorts at all. Sometimes we heard screams and we'd carefully look. We learned quickly never to move the car if anything shady happened in the parking lot at night while we were in there. The cops would be looking for witnesses, and if they thought you saw something and were leaving, you could be detained and that would blow our cover. So on the nights we heard a crash, screams, swearing, we'd point the dash cam over, click on the auxiliary battery, then go back to sleep until morning. We'd then rotate the memory cards. If a cop asked, we'd be like, our car was parked here, we can check the camera and thus be able to help with plausible deniability of our homeless self's presence. Our jobs at the store were our alibi. At any given time, I had our real schedules and fake ones I'd knocked together on my laptop and printed at the library with a little corner dog ear code to indicate which was real and which wasn't. They keep changing it was perfectly believable to cops, as was disorganized paperwork, and it's a hell of a long commute. Sometimes it's just easier to get here and have a nap. Oh well, in that case, yeah, just stay safe, okay? Was that officer's response. That one probably knew we were bougie homeless, but bougie homeless people aren't a problem for cops. So as long as they stay invisible, they aren't a problem for anyone but themselves. Well, and occasionally paranoid people. We had a stalker for a while towards the end, an older white guy with a cane. He saw me at the checkout one time and just seemed off. He recognized me at the library where I used the internet a lot and seemed really weird. He saw me with my husband, got edgy at the store, and then he started to follow us. A big, awful, awkward confrontation. Yeah, did you know Workers' Comp hires private detectives to chase old people with bad backs and hip replacements to confirm they're really as disabled as their doctors say? My husband just cracked up laughing, dished the dirt, and explained what we really were. Showed our poor stalker some proof that, no, we weren't detectives hunting him, we're just homeless and the whole thing led to us having the first beer we'd tasted in six months in a VFW with the coolest old guy ever, who told the story to some of his buddies, and suddenly we had help on our house hunt. It was really amazing help. I sometimes tell my students, my neighbor used to be my stalker. No, really, this is a funny story, and they're just like, Miss Spidey, no. Another thing I remember from being homeless was the young couple with baby twins. They were living in a 1994 Toyota station wagon because the fiancé slash husband's mother had thrown them out of her house for not wanting her in the delivery room. C-sections, they told me. The mom gets one person. They were younger than my husband and I were by almost six years, somehow managing retail jobs at the store and community college and I don't know how the social workers had missed them, but they had been well and truly missed. They never failed to make it to WIC appointments or, well, baby Medicaid visits, and they'd had the sense to get a P.O. box at a real address UPS store because the mother-in-law had been reading and stealing their mail before the blow-up, so it looked like they were just slipping under the radar. Their Toyota broke down, and as the fiancé wrestled with the idea of calling that awful woman back, my husband almost broke the kayfabe to help them fix it. He told them, truthfully, that we used to have a 94 before we got our current car. We took a look at it, and sure enough, my husband bet he could make it to the local junkyard to get what he needed. Really? The fiancé asked. Sure, 
my husband responded. He was back awfully quickly for a junkyard, and I saw the auto zone charge on our carts later. We could spare it. They sure couldn't. The twins are a year ahead of our daughter in school, and in one of those coincidences you wouldn't believe if this were a movie, they attend the same one. I ran into their mother in the parking lot of a school event just a bit over a month ago, in February, when I was wrist deep in a fellow mom's leaky mercury. She stopped, said my name, I bonked my head on the hood, then the years came rushing back. Her babies are so tall now, and she's lost that thin, burned out look. The 94 is gone. She sold it to her kid sister-in-law for a hundred bucks, and it's somehow still on the road. She and her husband are doing great. He's a sysadmin, and she's an LPN. He's grown a neat beard, and she's grown her hair out. They were just about to close on a house not too far from ours. So for their housewarming party, we bought a present. They knew all along the part wasn't from the junkyard. Our kids played together like cousins. We didn't discuss before, just the now. She knows, I know, but the now is so grand. I take groceries to our former stalker. Since he's older and shouldn't be out in the quarantine among a few other folks, the pot dealer's cousin sold me my most recent set of tires. I decided against a set of gaudy wheels, not being all that good at parallel parking without scruffing the curb sometimes. My LPN friend is an essential worker, as is her husband, so I have my kid and her twins most days because my type of teacher is basically off, apart from some minimally challenging assignments and grading stuff. I have no idea what became of the kid whose mom needed Narcan often enough that they likened it to a phone charger, or the people who got into late night parking lot fender benders and fights. So what's the worst thing I saw while homeless? That heinous fuckery can happen to perfectly nice people. My former belief that good things happen to good people and that poor people are only poor because they make bad choices or don't try hard enough. Yeah, that was the first casualty of the street. I recently moved from the US to the Balklands for a summer legal internship. After a few days of getting settled in my home for the summer, I decided to sign up to a gym close to my apartment to serve as a self-care ritual and blow off steam after tough work days. Coming home from my first workout at the new gym, endorphins on a hundred, I noticed at a crosswalk that a man across from this busy street where I stopped was staring at me. Now this isn't really uncommon as I found out in my new home and I've gotten used to dealing with occasional male stares, but they are usually very brief. This guy, however, was not looking away. I stared back for a full beat, so I knew that he knew I saw him. I hoped that would be the end of it, and then I turned my head away to continue down the street, trying to avoid a creepy feeling that this wasn't the end of the interaction. From what I could tell, he didn't cross the lengthy street to meet me and probably just continued down from his side. Next thing I knew, about two minutes later, I'm at the crosswalk, about to cross, when I see him in my peripheral next to me at the stop. How he crossed the street and sped up to meet me so quickly is either a reflection of his cunning and athletic prowess or my general lack of observational skills. Standing next to me, he continued staring at me but I tried not to tip him off to me noticing this. I took off as fast as I could when it was safe to cross the crosswalk, and naturally, he matched my pace, a step or so behind me, still staring. Here I find myself in a familiar situation that I imagine many who have been followed also find themselves in. It's a critical juncture, if you will, where you ask, is this someone following me or a silly misunderstanding? I begin to ask myself, am I overreacting? I've been followed many a time before, sadly, and so I have found that the best way to handle it is to try to cut the baby in half, so to speak. 
I give them the benefit of the doubt to prove to me that they aren't doing what I fear they're doing, while also trying to avoid any situation that would escalate the danger or cue him up to where I'm going. Trust, but verify. So I decided to zip quickly towards another street, not my own, in the hopes that he would prove me wrong and not continue to follow me. This was a busy intersection, and there were about six different streets to follow from the crosswalk. He followed me down this random street choice, where there is truly only residential buildings. No stores or restaurants he could be headed toward that could explain him choosing this street, unless he lived nearby. I did something I've done before, when followed, to test the other person. I slowed down and sped up my pace randomly to see if they will match mine, or like a normal person heading somewhere, try to walk by me as there was plenty of room to do so on this street. Within a block or so, I realized he was definitely following, definitely still staring, but not only that. With every few steps, I felt his presence, keeping pace, was also suddenly getting closer and closer to me. The sun is setting at this point and we were walking towards a part of town that I didn't know as well. The spirit moves, and I decided to make a break for it. I slowed down as slow as I've gone throughout this whole pursuit, checking in my peripheral, and jettisoning myself across the street until I got onto the other side. Once I get across, I look back once more, to see that he was now staring across the street, and moved toward it to follow me more. But this time, I give him the meanest glare I can muster, and I reached for my bag, as if to suggest that I was reaching for pepper spray or something. He noticed the gesture, made eye contact, stopped, and then he turned his head away to feign looking at the numbers on the street, like he was lost or looking for a specific spot, as if he hadn't been slowing up and speeding down with me for the past ten minutes, not looking anywhere but at my backside. His acting was 0 out of 10 for capturing the innocence of somebody definitely not creepily following women half his age back from the gym for 20 plus minutes. He continued to pretend to look around, glanced back at me, looked around some more, glanced back at me again, and when he looks away for the third time, I decided that then is the time to truly make a break for it. I begin booking it down the opposite street while occasionally peering back to see if he kept following. I take a bunch of well-lit, busy streets, employing random unnecessary turns as I have when I've been followed before. Eventually, when I checked out the whole street and felt confident that I'd lost him, I finally calculated my way back home. The next day, I asked a friend from work who's a local to take me to get some pepper spray. I bought a mini version the smallest size that can easily fit in a purse. The pepper spray's brand name for a bottle of this size is literally called Madame, which is emblazoned across the side of the bottle in bright pink lettering. In this case, I was working the graveyard shift at a call center we were an inbound and outbound call center contracted to handle the call center loads from various companies. The clients ranged from banks and moneylenders to budding cellular companies that were just forming then. I was handling a call for a man in New York. His name was John. John called technical and policy support because for some reason he wasn't able to text anymore. Texting was still pretty new at the time, at least in terms of the capacity we know it to be now. The man seemed pretty chipper, all things considered, and we chatted away about random stuff while I walked him through the troubleshooting script on my PC. Here I have to comment that if the cell phone people had was of excellent quality, and my PC was running great as well, I could hear somebody mowing the lawn across the street, even if the windows and doors were all closed. We're talking amazing levels of details. In this case, this was a boon. But in general, it's annoying given how many people have the TV on in the background. It's real distracting to troubleshoot phone issues while I'm hearing the news somewhere in the back. Due to this level of detail, I could hear some sort of vehicle break hard outside. 
The man was distracted and attempting to describe what was happening to his phone since starting troubleshooting. I heard what sounded like the front door get violently kicked in, and John let out a startled yelp. I told you to stay away from Heather. Four gunshots ring out. They were so loud I actually had to toss off my headset. My ears literally rang because of the amplification software in the PC, making it feel like I was in the room with John when the shots rang out. Once my hearing returned to my one good ear, my supervisor flags me over to his office we called air traffic control due to the angled windows literally resembling an airport control tower. I was sat down while my supervisor called 911 in John City. Since he had access to what I was working on, he knew where John was, complete with the address. Police and first responders arrived and found John unconscious but alive. While he'd taken all four rounds, not a one had hit anything critical. I'd find out later he took one in his left collarbone, one in the right shoulder when he twitched in response to the hit in his left shoulder bone, one in the left hip, and one to the left thigh. The kinetic trauma was enough to knock him out cold. When the after action report came out, John had been taken to the hospital where he was stabilized and treated for the bullet wounds. As for our gunman, here's what led up to the shooting and what happened after, as it was explained by my supervisor. The gunman was the older brother of a woman named Heather. John was very sweet on her. The gunman and John had met previously since all three went to the same bar. For whatever reason, the gunman didn't like the look or vibe of John. From my perspective, even for a New Yorker, John seemed like an amazing guy. I'd even go as far to say I'd date John if that was his thing. The gunman approached John and said point blank he didn't like him. He said he felt John was a creep and warned him to stay away from his sister. John heeded the warning, at least in visible public. John had already been given her number and the pair chatted over the phone. This led to clandestine rendezvous at motels as they began to entangle romantically. Oh yes, those two got it on. Apparently, it was also part of the thrill that Mr. Gunman could find out and rage. That's exactly what happened. One of the gunman's buddies spotted the pair leaving a motel, known for quick dalliances, and told the gunman. The gunman waited until the next morning so he could catch John at home before work. He plucked his 38 revolver out of his gun box in his truck and invaded John's home. The police were curious why only four of six shots were loaded, suggesting the gunman had shot two rounds before this incident, but never reloaded. They'd never find out, and neither would we. To paraphrase Joan Rivers, Mr. Gunman, who are you wearing? Oh, is that state penitentiary? The gunman would eventually be tried and convicted of charges ranging from firearm violations, menacing and intimidation, assault with a deadly weapon, and attempted murder. We didn't find out what happened with John and Heather, but we presume that despite the trauma, they either got and stayed together, or they split up for good. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you'd like me to read on the channel, please send me an email or post it to my subreddit. You can find details of this in the video description. It's the stories that make this, and this is the best way to ensure variety in the stories I share. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my channel members and patrons who now have special access to ad-free videos and other behind-the-scenes content. Shaz. Betty Brantley, Candice Lee, Africa Winfield, Becca, Lydia Adams, Girl Veteran, Legends CBZ 69 2012, Katrina King, Hospital Cakewalk, Dirty Diana, Quinta Siegel, Shirley Porch, Taylor Ruist, Annalisa Petrie, Jasmine Davis, Janelle Jensen, Jasper Roth, Alex, Monica Levelace, 
James Gargano, Sarah P, Fire 05, Matt is a Felter, Tierra Sanders, Melissa Kingery, Kitty Cat Luna 2, Chelsea Moffat, Ryan, Gabrielle, Jenny, Sarah, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Sam, Amanda Jane, Vampy Debs, October Gypsy, Rebecca, Erica B, Maribel De Luna, Lloyd Rash, Jennifer Jenkins, Kelly Townsend, Mary Wright, Tara Harris, Elizabeth Knapp, Eddie, Sean Gorman, Sue Gordon, Spider's Web, Kay, Christy, Absinthe Alice, Dina Kingery, Snowball Rathena, Lady Drackard, Brenda, Pretty Girl 215, Amber Davis, Sigma Cube X, Letitia Acklin, Ali O'Neill, Gina Eberhardt, Lilypad, Ashley Nicole, Sara Chifalo, May 2nd, 2003, Bella Plays, 2006, Skin Crawler, Stephanie McLaren, Borderline Betty, Kuro, Top Off, Kelly Ann Bain, Michael O'Malley, Neil Kavanagh, The Dead Movie Society, Diana Johnston, Taya Atwell, Danielle, Possum Posse, Crafty Kell, Brooke, Scott McKenzie, Megan Abrams, Jane Wiggins, Jasmine Davis, Jack White, Your Pappy's Dilly, Emma Lisa, Tanya Ferguson, The Wendy, Ember Hops, Alexia Tuttle, Ram Beltran, Elizabeth Mayers, Unladylike 13, Pegasus Genesis, Sheila Grant 44, Sona, Scout Mom 405, Cheryl Duckworth, Ashley Bray, Angela Reeves, Kim Thompson, Brock Bollard, Nick Bigdowski, Jessica Lasley, Yennefer, Clary Scott, Timothy Stratton, Melissa Kingery, Shane Stevens, Serge Vargas, Bart in Real Life, April Jordanet, Lisa Prentice, Mason Hayes, Sarah Price, Jasmine Thomas, Angie Lindon, Z Harris, Kirby Harris, Yolo Sapien, Lavina Cordelia, Misty Racour, Michelle Green, Dixie Busby, Paula Ferreira Nieves, Samantha Place, Donna Cox, Stephen Wheeler, Melissa Moore, Deshaun Edmondson, This Bad Kitty, Gloria, Christina Myway, Connie Sue, Carol Zaffirano, Merciful Humming, Kelsa Rundle, Ashley Juster, Vicky Howell, Joe Tozer, Zoe D, Nicholas Johnson, Kimmy Love. Once again, thank you guys for listening. Have a great night.